One of the nicest artist talks I ever went to was by Marlene Dumas. And it was a very funny, it was a funny talk because she projected herself. And she projected past interviews of herself and projected past studio visits with herself. But what was great was she then paused it and she would comment on her comments. And she was very candid. She, she said things like, oh, this was 10 years ago. I really don't think those thoughts now. And I thought that was quite interesting because actually as, as artists, we tend to change our minds. Well, and we tend to grow as humans. So, you know, what you thought 10 years ago, you cannot think now. But we can't do that with Ian Sovereign. But I have an interview with Ian from this period. So I thought, yeah, I could maybe read a little bit of you to yourself and you could tell us, <laughs> you could tell us a little bit about the time, because after all, technically speaking, right now we're in 1998. Somehow Ian thinks that I should do all the top tip for him today. <laughs> what he doesn't know is I'm like him. I don't know much. You were asked, when did you start doing this line of exploration we see in your painting? You reply. The first time I was, I was using so many things in my paintings was when I came back to Singapore from England in 1997. I guess I was trying to find the language of living here. Singapore is a very strange country. I grew up here in a mix of Chinese and Western culture. A lot of American TV, Western movies, and Hong Kong serials. There were two Chinese paintings in my house. One with a bunch of monkeys. The other was a picture of a tiger. My grandmother would say that if you wanted to be an artist, you would have to be able to paint as good as this. When I went to the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, I wanted to paint like Van Gogh. I tried, but of course I couldn't. So slowly I developed what I tried to see in art. A lot of my paintings are mental investigations, painting from imagination. Yeah, so that's uh, me trying to um, remember what I saw when I was younger, and then deciding what is this visual language I was after. And the only way is to, to remember certain things that you have seen. Uh, not that I know a lot about ink painting. Uh, back then or even now, uh, now I have read some books about it. And I've spent like... Uh, even six months making ink paintings. Uh, but I never felt uh, a, a kind of affinity with it in the making. But I do like looking at it and looking at it in terms of what other people, uh, or rather the, the, the masters, the way they make it. Uh, for me, uh, going to museums, uh, going to galleries, hanging out with artists uh, was my way of uh, understanding myself and the world. Yeah. So would you say that the paintings that are in this space now, a lot of the forms are sort of the byproduct of kind of gestural memories, traces of gestural memories? Yeah. So I guess I started off with drawing. I think drawing was always important to me. Um, I always drew as a kid. Um, and I always remember that I would draw a line and it, was, it wasn't right. I would sometimes even change the paper, and then I will get punished for changing the paper because the point is that you don't change the paper, you will erase it and you will draw another line. So I always was fascinated with this idea of making marks actually from a young kid, all the way to a point whereby I started making my earliest paintings in Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. And it was difficult because oil painting is messy stuff. It's not like drawing where, you know, you are de dealing with mediums that dry faster. You're also dealing with mediums that are dry, you know, so there's always a bit of rubbing here and there, you know, uh, a bit of, uh, you're applying colours, but they dry very quickly, you can respond to it by layering. But with oil painting, it was, it was tough, you know, I first started, it was all this very, it was just very messy stuff. And then I would work too fast and then it just gets all muddy and everything. So I wasn't very good with oil painting when I was doing my diploma. I actually struggled with it a lot. Uh, so drawing was one way for me to, to work my way through that education. And um, I only got into painting better when I was doing my BA in the UK. 
And it started when one day after making drawings for a long time, I just took some oil painting and applied it, and, and I applied it very thickly. And suddenly I just, the sensation sort of like hit me. And um, I began to understand what painting was about. It was kind of sculptural. I saw this sculptural part of it, which I never saw when I was studying earlier. Mm -hmm. So all these things, uh, they are re really like physical relationships that you have with the medium, actually. So talking back to the idea of traces, yeah, the, I guess this is a vocabulary that a lot of painters carry with. I don't always think about the idea of a signature, how we sign our names, and how we see that signature as connecting to a kind of identity. So do you think when you first came back and you were making these paintings, you were sort of searching for a signature? Yeah, I, I think I'm still searching. But interestingly, we talked about 1997. Yeah. So uh, for the audience here, there is one work here, which is this way. <laughs> Later, you can go and see it right at the back there. Uh, it's the first painting that I made in 1997 when I returned back from my studies uh, from the UK. So when I arrived back in Singapore, that, was, that work here is called Wall of Fiction. And that is the first work I made. And I remember I kind of like was struggling with it because I was thinking about uh, what to paint, you know. And I think this, when I say what to paint, it's very interesting because I just visited a very prominent artist in Malaysia three days ago. And he says, you know, Ian, you know, one of the key things for artists, especially painters, is always what to paint, uh, how to paint. And I thought that was really valuable, what he reminded me of. And it's a daily thing that you, you encounter, these questions. And I think that making art is basically you setting up questions for yourself. So, what to paint? So when you come back, when you first came back in 1997, six, Yes, yeah. You were trying to think about what to paint. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I agree with you. I think this is a constant question for painters, what to paint and how to paint. So, is a question for me to continue? Uh, no, I'm going to go to the next question. Yes. I can continue with that question, we but come, I'll, wait, I'll wait. So, you ask, when you say that the things in your paintings are your mental images, not from reality, what do you mean? And what you said in reply was, when I work, I do not work from reference. Let's say I put a few slabs of paint on the canvas, move it and watch what happens. It's very much to do with painting the idea of painting and discovering possibilities of picture making. Basically, the relationship between me and the paint or me and whatever material I use is very important. Usually when I think of something that I want to paint, it doesn't come out exactly the way I plan to be. Well, not yet, anyway. Still, I think it's not yet still, even now. What I find interesting in this relationship is the growth of each organism that comes out from the paint, the interconnections that results from negotiating the very different acts and possibilities of painting. I, I think I could apply that to your present. Actually, can I just ask, is there anyone here that doesn't know Ian's paintings in the present, as opposed to 1998? Good. So we are all on the same, we're all on board here. I, I think the, this, your reply, can still apply now. Yeah, I think that it's, uh, it's still a very complex process, which, and I, when I say complex, I don't mean that it is difficult in ways that is not pleasurable. I think it is difficult in ways that is pleasurable, because otherwise, why continue, right? Now we will, we will talk about um, what to paint, in, in the sense you have the space of the pictorial, and the pictorial is, you can do anything to it, you know, to start that conversation. Um, so I don't think much when I start, you know, because it doesn't really matter. It is just stuff that's there, and then at some point, I will respond to it, you know, and things would evolve. People talk about being afraid about a blank canvas. I think that's, I don't really get that at all. I think the critical thing for me is always in the middle, almost towards the end. That's when things can get tightened up a little bit, tightened up in terms of the, des the decisions I'm about to make. When I talk about this com complex idea of 
of making images is really a, because I'm interested in abstraction. I think abstraction can come from reality. Uh, and when we talk about uh, abstraction representing reality, I do have problems with that. But I think if we talk about the idea of representations with an S, plural, that's fine. Because I think it's unavoidable, especially when you see the work here, that as I make the image, one of the fascinating things about painting is that when you, when you make an image or a mark, it can either be a space or it can be an object, depending on how the pigments move. You know? And that is one of the things that drew me to, to painting. Yeah? So you can make an empty space or you can, at some point, the empty space can become solid. You can change the temperature, you can change the color. So the world is, your, is, is the way you want, the way you can, you can sort of like, it's like a, you're driving a huge craft that you can decide where you want to land. And that to me is, is great, you know, to me. So it's, it's a trick that I can design for myself. And whether I get lost in it, that's something that, yeah, great, you know, we'll see what happens. And whether I can get out of it, that's another thing. Or maybe for some books I never get out, I'm always stuck in it, yeah. So I start to make up this arrangement of things. I used the word arrangement quite a bit. Uh, and you can see this idea of the arrangement of things for me to find an order that allows me to maybe get a sense of what this, uh, lack of a better word, I, identity for this work is. And when I say identity, I use it very loosely. So I think it's this arrangement of things and I'm looking for how things are coming together. And how things come together is about connections. And connections can deal with similarities and differences. So for example, I can have some things that we, can, we, we think alike and we can have a common vision about it. I can also decide not to talk to you and get, because I'm fed up with you but we are sitting together, but um, I just want to talk to you. But we are still in the same room, you know, and that, could, that is still a relationship. So I think the idea of things linking up, delinking, or about to link, that's pretty much the, the, the kind of activity that's happening in these works. In, in terms of this idea of picture making, it, it seems to me that the work you make in this time, the, the idea of the picture is more complete than the work you make now. The work you make now, it, at least to me, it seems like there are more different pictures in it simultaneously. Whereas these, these works are in, in some ways more, for lack of a better word, conventional. Yeah. Uh, or conservative. You said it, yeah. not me. Uh, well, someone's conservative is not someone else's cons conservative. So uh, I think there's always a place and time where any work is being made. And I think uh, for an artist, where, how, where we spend, the environment we spend in, it does affect what you make. When I was studying in Spain and, and England, the, the spaces that I was in, they, they do make me wake, make certain kinds of works in terms of the color, the, the lighting, and also, again, the, temp, the temperament, or rather the temperature. Uh, so when I came back here, um, spaces became smaller. Uh, a lot of these works were made in a study room, right? And uh, some of the works here were made in a small studio. So I was transi transitioning between looking for a studio space and I, Things were quite expensive here. I mean, it still is, it's getting more now. But back then, uh, I found a studio and worked in it for like, I think two years or one year, I can't remember. So these were made in that studio. It wasn't a big studio, it was quite small. In fact, maybe double the enclosure here. So it's a squ squ uh, square space and you make, I made like two works one, one time and stacked them up. And then later on, I'm, I decided to, okay, that's not a decision I want to continue with. So decisions, 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 growing up, right? And also about to have a family. And then I moved back to a, a, uh, my study room. And then I made some of these works in the study room and that one as well. So 
I think in the study room, what you have is also, and also the studio itself, is this fluorescent lights. You know, in Singapore, suddenly when I came back, I see more fluorescent lights than I was in the UK, I don't know. So I, that, that temperature changes the way I look at the imagery and also the space that I want to create, rather that fictional space that I wanted to create. And I know we talked about the idea of the still life. And as an abstraction is, if we want to link to the idea of the reality, I, I, for me, the still life is actually a, a timeless subject matter. Uh, I know we always talk about thinking about this subject matter that we can use and it's going to be a hit or a miss here. And this, back then here, the, the idea of a still life was that subject matter that I used as a way to pivot like a spine you know, to keep me where, like a checkpoint Charlie. Like. We checkpoint Charlie it says that wherever I go, right, I always would have this. So the idea was that, okay, I would start with thinking of something, like for example, my a toothbrush or maybe the knees, right? So it's a, it's a mental image, there's no reference to mental. So I would start drawing it, right, or painting it. Then at some point, I would, I would lose it because I would just think of something else, whatever. And then I would just let it go, you know? So basically that was the idea behind the work, right? You think of an of object from reality, then you translate it. Again, it sort of like shifts away from reality and then it goes away or it goes into something else. It morphs into something else. So basically that's the process of these works in a sense, that transformation, metamorphosis, yeah. So do you think the process of the works in the other room is different from the works in this room? Because they are significantly different. Yeah, I think the process of, I think the spaces here are interesting. They are, they are to me, they, they I think I was talking to a friend the other day about the idea of the inventory. And for me, because these were the early days where I was trying to look for what to paint. So the idea of this still life on shelves, not that I'm, you are seeing shelves here. You see, I, when I say this words, I'm always quite worried because, oh, is that shelves there? You know, that, no, that shelves was... Sushi. But shelves, if you take shelves abstractly, shelves are just compartments that you can place things in. So let's not use the word shelves here. Let's use the word compartments. So there are many kinds of compartments that you can keep things or, or reveal things. So the, these were a way for, a kind of structure for me to think yeah. through the works. And the idea of the inventory is to, almost to arrange things again and to see what matches and what doesn't match, but still have some connections to something else, you know. So perhaps it's my way of thinking about what we have in, in our house what we choose to place in our living rooms or in our private spaces. Oh, the, the works, works behind, right? So a bit of context about the works in another room. So this is the cool room. So the room in, in uh, next door, I'll say the next door. So interestingly, we are talking about compartments. There's one compartment here, another compartment there. So uh, the, other com the other space, uh, they are actually the, the works that I made for my first solo exhibition. This is before I had my solo exhibition. So I would count that when I had my solo exhibition, it is the beginning of my professional career as an artist. That's how I oh. give myself a certificate. And, yeah. and where, where was this show? This show was at the La Salle Gallery. It's actually a small gallery at the Goodman Art Centre. And for those who know Goodman Art Centre, I know some of you all have studios there. It is where the security guard is upstairs. Okay? That's the clue that I will give you. If you're interested, go and find it, okay? So it was a great gallery, two stories, small, and it had wooden panels on it. So there was a selection of those works. So for me, those works was more external. The space that I was trying to depict was perhaps external. There's a lot of red in it. Mm -hmm. So to me, that red is also, it's about heat, you know? The temperature is like rising, you know? So to me, alchemy is, you know, I know you're going to get me at that at some point. But alchemy is uh, it's something that I think about, yeah. but it's not something that I take it very seriously because I'm always going like, you know, I'm not sure whether... It's quite a heavy word, but I do think about elements, you know, and how things change in spaces. So to me, in the sense, that space that I'm creating there is almost me getting out of my house and into the world. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the, this, this looks much more interiorized and that looks more exteriorized but in, in many ways the work the work of your your present work is 
combine is in place with both inside and outside. Yeah, and also closeness far away. And, and you know, like I think about the idea of, you know, when I talk about the organism, I think art is actually a kind of organism. Uh, it is actually, uh, it's like a plant. You start to grow it, and then at some point it, it becomes alive. I know you, yeah. <laughs> So what, what was that? What, what was what's going about? <laughs> I was talking about. You, you went off on your own. <laughs> Side I was distracted. I was distracted. Shall I go to the next question? No, no, no. The, the other question was, oh, yes. It has to do with, uh, you know, the idea of organism. You see yeah. them on a the microscope, yeah. right? It's, it's close. You see a different perspective. You can see a kind of a world, you know, that is very, a micro world. And then you have the real world that you see at the distance. And then there are things you can go on top. You see sideways. And then there's also the perspective of the dream world. Yeah. The, the dream world is very fascinating. The, what is the perspective of the dream world when you just see a fragment of a dream, you can't remember. I think there are perspectives in the dream world. Uh, then there is also, you know, things that are cropped. You know, how do you, why do we crop things? Because we don't want to see something else. We want to focus on an activity that's happening. So a lot of my, my new work was, is really about focusing on maybe an engagement of two things or three things. Points of view. Yeah, points of view. But do you think when you're with these paintings that where the crop is, there is um, there is space outside of the crop? Yeah. So what what you have is uh, these things elements where they actually get cropped off at the side. Yeah. And I really like that because I I think that to me I think a lot of my works I would have. Uh, appearances of these things from from out of the canvas into the canvas. Why? Because I was interested in how do you extend time beyond the pictorial frame? It looks like a very simple device, but actually to me it's quite critical because when you look at the work, yeah, you may not... You, this thing is more like a kind of unconscious thing that is like nagging, but it's, it's also giving you a sense of to complete what is not reviewed. At the ages. Me as the viewer. But it's abstract. Yeah, but or, yeah. Or, or you may not even think it's in, uh, important to even take note. But I think there are a lot of things that we don't need to know sometimes as a viewer to enjoy or not enjoy a work. When you say time it with the painting, what do you mean by time in the painting? Or time outside the painting? Uh, so in relationship to the idea of the ages, I think when you look at a painting, you are, you are essentially seeing things that are coming together or separating. So when I say coming together, or it's continuous. So the idea of the continuous uh, action is connection, is connecting to ideas of time for me. Because it's, you are, I'm sure like creating um, things that are seen, things that are not seen, and you kind of have to make up uh, what is not uh, suggested there, and that making up is a way to to conjure a kind of temporal inter interaction. Uh, I I don't think it's something that everyone uh, is conscious of, or maybe audiences yeah. are conscious of, because I think you, it does take time to look at works uh, or paintings because they are static, mm -hmm. and. What I like about paintings is that each time I look at them, I see different things depending on the point that I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. So each time I look at a different point, I'm seeing different things uh, evolving. Uh, so I see that also as conjuring uh, a kind of temporal change. Mm -hmm. Another uh, idea of time that I'm interested in is the fact that, you know, when we talk about compartments, right, I talk about this quite often. And uh, I'm always fascinated. Maybe this comes from a kind of musical analogy. So, for example, there is we we are talking in this room about art, and we're trying to get as, we are we are trying to get to a certain point here. But I don't know who is next door. Some people are at the sides there. You know, so there are different kind of temporal things happening in this room and the next door, and also at the side and also outside. You know, so the world is made out of multi, multiple compartments. And so making this is also one way of trying to create this multiple kind of spaces mm -hmm. for one to sense uh, different things happening. 
in one space. So to me, abstraction and improvisation is, 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 is they are wonderful activities because I'm also looking to try to surprise myself. And in a sense, I am actually quite chaotic actually, but I, I think Tony Godfrey always says that, hey, you, I think the tidy, tidying up comes later. I always, it's always very chaotic in the beginning. Then at some point, I find something that is connecting, then I start to tidy them up. But at the same time, I was asking myself, why should I tidy up? You know, there are these questions that always come to me. Do you, do you think you become less tidy as you get Yeah, maybe I should. Maybe you were tidier when you were younger. Yeah, well, this looks pretty tidy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they look very, um, what do you say, conservative? Yeah, but maybe I was trying to be, maybe I wanted to envision this other side of war. war. Was it possible that you first came back to Singapore and you, you saw a more orderly place? So maybe the, what came out? Oh, so you think that my world is connected to Singapore so as, as, a so, you, as, as a social as, space? As, you were trying to figure it out? Yeah. I, I, I mean, if, if I that... can't, I can't, yeah, I, I'm sure it is. I, I talked about the idea of the environment yeah. so earlier on. So there, there lies the answer. Oh. Yeah. You're actually much more articulate than I am. Really? If I had to talk about my work, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't get straight. Okay, um, it's going to be downhill from here. Okay, <laughs> next one. <laughs> uh, what is it like? from in being in 2023, looking at 1998. Well, you started it, you know. I didn't start it, yeah. I didn't start it. So I showed you that work there, the finger food, right? So I was going like, hey, you know, we just, I just renovated my space. We had some drinks in my, so I brought this out, you know, have a look. I think it was just not just you and a couple, I think we had a couple of people in, in the audience in the, in the, my, the space. And then uh, you asked me a couple of questions about this, then I brought out this, and then start, started the home ball yeah. rolling. And then the question never ended until we had this show. Uh, more questions. Yeah, there were more questions. I'm and, sure there are uh, more questions out there. Yeah, I'm sure there are, yeah, I'm sure there are more. So looking back, uh, I'm actually pretty fascinated. I, 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 I'm thinking, hey, you know, I could do that again, you know. I'm telling myself, you know, as I, you know, before this show, right, before this show, I mean, these things were hanging in my studio set. And I'm going like, hey, you know, I could bring that back to the new world. What is this, you know? So is this flattened space? So I had these paintings, they all had very flattened space. In my current work, and also the work behind, you will notice that the spaces, all this background, the environment that I'm creating, yeah, they are not flat, they are, they are quite active. Well, they are more atmospheric. Atmospheric, actually. Yeah. But your work has that quality. I mean, there is also atmosphere here, but it's a very still. Yeah. It's very still because of the, the very flat grounding. And I'm going, you know, this flat grounding is really fascinating. You know, maybe I should bring it back. Well, maybe it will happen. Maybe, maybe my, my next show, like, like next month, you'll see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but so there are, there are, it's, it's quite tempting, some of the things that I would like to re revisit. And also the idea of um, drawing. And the, the, the marks are a little bit different in, this, in the sense that they are, they are quite light the touch is quite light uh, and also the way I, I paint is so quite light they're almost like like uh, I'm like dabbing mm -hmm. for some of them I feel like I'm dabbing rather than sh like the strokes yeah it, and I'm making an interpretation that these these paintings feel a lot calmer yeah. than the paintings you're making now yeah. maybe something's gone wrong yeah <laughs> maybe you work too hard yeah I think we, you talked to me about uh, anxiety. Yes, yeah. yes. My, my, uh, the last, the first time I wrote about Ian was only after I finished that I sort of thought, actually, maybe his work has to do with anxiety. Mm. That um, mm. but the, the paintings express a kind of anxiety and an inability to be, to be still, to have constantly shifting focus. Yeah. Yeah. So I do, I do have that in me. Uh, I think I'm a very anxious painter. <laughs> I was, I was also, I, w if you, I am an anxious painter today. I was an anxious painter even back then. They do look calm, but I, I think, I'm, I still believe that I was always anxious as a painter. So maybe in 1998, you didn't find your inner anxiety yet. It was just all suppressed. So maybe these are, 
these are kind of like fantasies. This is yeah. where you want to be. I think repressions and and suppressions are great. They are, yeah. They are what at some point you know you just have to burst out. You know? But not all the not every day like Every day you burst out. You know, from is like yeah. So I'm going to go back to 1998. Last, last one. You ask, how do you find your mental image? And what you say is, I wish people would ask me more questions like that. Note to you guys. <laughs> I like to paint atmospheres and spaces, create multi-events like how some areas in painting are crowded with things and how some are not, how things are coming together and falling apart. Like in this painting, points to the mind plot, not in this show. <laughs> now all these spaces and all these relationships I always think about how movies are made and how in movies you have one screen but it moves. The element of time from one scene to the next. And you are left, left, left thinking of the last image scene while trying to concentrate on the current one. Whereas in a picture or painting, there is only one frame. The picture is static. I try to be inspired by the difficulty and possibility of creating the effect that things are moving and, in t and time is continuous. I feel like in that in that description, you could be talking about your paintings in the present. Yeah, so when you, when you read that, I'm just thinking about back to the idea of the temporal and looking at the paintings. Do we look at paintings like uh, things appearing from the left to the right or right to the left, top, down? They disappear to the top, disappear from the, to the down, or they disappear left, right, you know? Or do you see things evolving and changing in front of you, not, not sideways back, you know, not this way? So there is a reading of how the works are changing like that. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to describe, but basically if I don't, like Cezanne, where he didn't, he did, where he did those drawings of uh, Mount Vitoire, the sketches, it was one of the earliest um, images. Now that's a mental image where the lines are being suggested or points are being suggested and you have to fill up the rest, you know. It is not about the realism of the thing, but it was a suggestion of the thing, but it was also about how uh, think, uh, the space is changing. You know, he's suggesting to you, you can experience that there is something that is evolving when you look at it. So there's this, there's this other element, which actually, this, what, what I'm trying to say here is what I'm, I'm trying to respond to what has been said in 1997. Eight. Actually, it's probably later than that. Yeah. So maybe there, there is a bit more detail, but I'm trying to respond in there I, in a very simplistic way. But I, 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 I think some of the things you say here are still some of the things you are working through. Some of your, you could easily apply this to your current paintings. I, I think I only, I always tell some friends of mine, I think I only make one work. <laughs> it just goes round and round and round like that. Yeah. I think that's true of all artists. Of many out. I don't change that much. I'm, I'm not someone that changes very frequently. So it takes me a while to change things. Do you think of yourself as someone who goes back to your past in different ways and reconfigures it? Yeah, I think uh, it's something that uh, once in a while is good. Not too often. Not too often. Um, yeah. Right. I think we can let we can talk about your past work in the present now. Okay. Questions? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's hard to answer that question without responding to the idea of, it depends on the supports that are being used. So when I say supports, it's like the stretcher, whether I'm painting on a canvas or I'm painting on wood or whether I'm priming the wood before I paint uh, or I'm painting on raw wood, which I, or I'm painting on objects, because I've, I've made a couple of relief objects um, the last four years, uh, which has shifted the way I see uh, painting, or, ra or rather the pictorial uh, device. Uh, I think I made a couple of works in 2018 for a public space uh, at Esplanade, when I was trying to connect the train, people walking from the train, the experience of people walking from the train to the theatre, and I was had this works along the wall, and 
you could see the works on the side, you know. And I would never want to do this for the pictures that I'm showing here. Uh, because I think that there are, I like to bring out key things uh, for, some, for the audience to co concentrate on. I don't really like to give an audience too many options to deal with. I, I'm not for that. I, I, I like to make it easy for them to start with. Yeah. So that's my answer for that. In terms of my relationship with pain, I think I never see it changing much. I mean, for me, I sometimes don't even think about color, actually. So a lot of people ask me about, you know, what's the relationship with color? I mean, I love Joseph Al Al Albers, you know, and, uh, but, uh, but I'm interested in how colors contradict and how they respond to each other. But I'm not thinking a lot about uh, them as symbols or anything like that. I, I never think of them as that. So it's relation. It's more relation. So everything is actually quite relation. So when I make paintings, it's because I enjoy the, the I, have, I take pleasure in constructing the image with the brush, with a scalpel knife or whatever, yeah. And just seeing an image evolve from there. Yeah, this a drawing is um, it's, uh, it's a constant. It's a, I have a dry space in the house that I work in. Uh, um, I have a trolley from IKEA that I can push around in the house so that I can get smaller works being to be made. Uh, so I have different devices that keep me going. I have my phone, yeah, and which has digital drawings that I made. <laughs> and uh, hey, you take a bus, you know, you do something. Yeah, so, so uh, and then I have, I do, I think in the paintings, I do think of drawing because when I'm doing line work, to me, I'm thinking of a drawing. But of course, the larger the, the, the canvas is, you know, the body starts to change. And you, know, you think, there's no more thinking. I always think that when the, the works, when the works get larger, you think less. You become very animalistic, you know, when you make the work. Very primal. So, yeah. Oh, so this question is about who, who was... <laughs> Uh, the instrument that I play, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm also a musician, so I, I, have, I play the bass guitar. So I think you're asking me the question of uh, the relationship of, the, of an instrument that is like of a low frequency, to be specific here. So the bass guitar is an instrument, it's like a double bass, it's like the lowest frequency. So how do I think about that in relationship to the visual? Well, I don't really like to correlate, oh, this painting is about this music and that's like... That's like uh, something I don't really want to go to. But, you know, what I want to say is that uh, I don't think of the bass as an instrument in relationship to drawing, but I think the idea of the bass as an instrument in relationship to painting, yes. Because the bass, because of its sound, which is a low frequency sound, it's, it shakes the, the room, you know. So it's like, the, it's about atmosphere. So that, to me, there's some connection. You know, when you play the bass, it's like really broad, the strokes. So to me, it's almost like, you think about like a rough core, you know, where you have these huge, huge slabs of colors that is just coming towards you and you are being engulfed by it. You, you have no choice but to be engulfed. So that's one way of thinking about it. Of course, I talk like that, you know, it, you know it makes it sound like it's, uh, it's you know, it's... Is, it, is the bass not the instrument that establishes the rhythm as well? Yes, it's also, yeah, it's an instrument that establishes the rhythm, but it's also a foundation where everything else sits on top. Yeah, it's like a, um, you create a room or a kind of environment for everything to take, take place in. So that's, it's not an instrument that is like a lead instrument. It's, actually, it's, it's, it's a very background instrument, yeah. which is why I talked about Rothko, because Rothko was making paintings without any things. It's kind of like without any things in it. Just backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. kind of backgrounds, painting background. Oh, by the way, if you are interested, Rothko was interested in the backgrounds of Rembrandt. He was looking at the backgrounds of Rembrandt and he was trying to make his paintings. No, I, I don't know too. I can't... I, I mean, this, this question, I, I, I'm... I, yeah, I don't think I can answer this now. It's a... Yeah, I, again, I was saying that I don't really want to equate it to, to the musical side. Yeah. I do use uh, ideas of, like, for example, composition. I do think about... Maybe... Okay, maybe the way, the way I should answer your question is the fact that so when I was making the, this, you know, I was listening to uh, the music of Morton Feldman. And Morton Feldman had a very strong relationship with Rothko. 
And Morton Feldman made music that was like, I mean, sometimes he would have string quartet or a brass, you know, and they'll play one note and then they will have silence for a while, you know, and then they'll play another note. And then there's a gap, you know, he's like, so he talks about the idea of incidents, mm -hmm. you know, and incidents is like what, you know, things that happen in your house and then there's no continuity and then something else happens again. So that's one way that I can think about in terms of these works as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have to maybe give you a more, uh, an example before. I, I don't want to just relate it as a kind of musical equivalent. But do you, do you think as a musician, maybe the idea of improvisation is related to the idea of improvisation in painting? Yeah. So uh, to Stanley Whitney, yeah. yeah, he's very popular now. So I have to talk about him and very colorful his work. So he has this, so Stanley Whitney is an American painter. You should check it out for those who don't, who don't know his work. So he paints slabs. They look like boxes, like, or bookshelves. So they have slabs of color. And he talks about them when he paints them. It's quite. He thinks about when a, a jazz soloist is improvising from the beginning to the end of the of the solo. So the solo there is a starting point, middle, and then the end. So he thinks about that when he's making that. So there's, you know, you build it up, and then there is a part where it's, it's uh, it does something very unusual. Then it goes back again. You know? So so yeah, improvising. Do you think it's easier? Because you play an instrument. No, I think everyone, different. actually, I think everyone does improvise. I mean, like, I think we, to a certain degree, we are kind of improvising in this talk. I mean, there is a plan that you had with the piece, this piece of paper. No, I don't know why yeah. I do it. <laughs> yeah, so I think we all improvise. And I think it's good to have that. I think it's healthy to have that. Uh, I think I do a lot of that in my, in my school, my job in, as a teacher. <laughs> I once told, my, told someone, I, I mean, that actually I run, I, I run the program, or rather I run the school, like as if I'm making a painting. <laughs> which, which one? These ones or those No, ones? no, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you, it's a secret. Some things have to be secret. <laughs> I meant that the painting was very thick, and when I applied it, I saw the potential that, hey, look, I don't have to make a painting that creates an illusion, a flat illusion, that simulates reality. It is real by itself. So the, the material. Yeah, it's like suddenly I realized that I can enjoy cakes now. You know, cakes always have this slab. You know, you know, cake decoration. You know, it's such a bad analogy. Or spreading, <laughs> or, or spreading butter, peanut butter. I mean, that's like when I spread the peanut, I was like, hey, this is beautiful. You know, you spread. Hey, there are many di it's different ways. Worse. No, it's get, there are many different ways of spreading the peanut butter. You know? Yeah. So I realized that, hey, you know, suddenly I realized that there's a potential in you know, the way I can, just, I can just do this, you know. He made these stained glass too quick. Yeah, I mean, yeah, some of them have a bit of texture. The, the ones behind here, they do have, they start to build up a little bit. So there's more value in those. Yeah. <laughs> and if you buy, you buy that, it's more worth it. You know, we can get more pain out of it. <laughs> well, you know, in the Renaissance, that's what, if you use blue, blue is very valuable. So you showed how much money you had, like what kind of color you put on it. Oh, the other thing I forgot is that those works behind there, I painted them as if the paintings were a palette. Because if you see at some of the marks that I make, it's like I'm actually mixing the paint on the... Now you tell me. <laughs> no, no, no. Now that she mentioned about this idea of the texture, you made me think that, yeah, it's more textural there. But it's also because I painted them as if I was mixing the paint. I mean, I was literally mixing the paint. And as I was mixing the paint, I went like, I'm mixing to apply to the right hand side. So I'm mixing, I'm going, hey, it looks good. And I kept it on the too. <laughs> so that's, that's how it worked. Oh, the best paintings here, that I do are on my palette. It's never on the painting. Yeah, you're right. You answered the, my question already. You said continuity. So I have one idea. I'm continuing with the one idea. I'm still staying with it. <laughs> I'm committed to it. We're going to be committed to it. Well, yeah. Talk, talk, talk a little, especially in the context of these words that were made 30 years ago. Yeah. What to say to anyone? Well, we talked about, I mean, I talked about the idea of compartments and systems. I still use that same idea in the, uh, my current work. You know? I still see when I make a shape that I'm creating either a space 
and then there's a kind of activity that's going to happen and I'm, I'm almost trying I'm trying to figure out what kind of activity is happening or maybe there's no activity happening and even that is important the like idea of nothingness the void which is still something that I'm very fascinated with you know what is a void uh, is there something or there is nothing in it I mean this is a lifelong thing that we're all trying to figure out every artist is trying to figure this out is there something in it or there's nothing in it? You know, this is a big question, isn't it? And we're all trying to move around, do this some, at some point, then we talk about it. Then a couple of weeks later, or years later, you, you discover that, you know, you want to have more things in the world, you know, and then things multiply. And when things multiply, at some point, they cancel each other out and then become nothing again. So when I talk about this idea of a continuous loop, you know, it's trying to stay with certain ideas that I had when I was younger. And of course, we have memory, right? That's our burden, right? Our burden, right? Our trauma, right? So we carry with them. And this trauma will not, I don't know about leaving you or not, but you try to capitalize on it, make the best out of it. Now that's my answer to your one word. Yeah. In closing, I just want to say that I, in answer to your question, I think if you read this interview, he's still consistently this. He seems to give the answer for the present rather than the past. So in that way, there is a continuity. So you should just give this interview a full time. Yeah, yeah, I should. Next 20 years. Actually, thanks for reminding me about this. I totally forgot what I said. You know, I think you were more articulate then than you are now. I know I'm saying. <laughs> All the words I forgot, my vocabulary get less and less. My inventory of, vocab of words get less and less. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.